We are now far enough into free agency that most of the big contracts have been signed, sealed, and delivered. So today I'm going to give you my opinion on the absolute best and worst contracts signed in the 2021 free agency period. And that's coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. Now as I mentioned today, we're taking a look at the best and worst contracts, in my opinion of course, during the 2021 NHL free agency period so far now. Of course, every year during free agency, we almost always get at least a few really bad deals that come back to haunt teams down the road. Teams are not built into winners through free agency. We've learned that time and time again. This is a draft and development league. However, teams can spend wisely and they can certainly get pieces to add and kind of put them over the top because an extra piece that they can acquire in a trade or in a free agent acquisition to help them kind of go from one step up a notch to try to contend for the Stanley Cup. It can work out. It can happen. But oftentimes, it's, it's a disaster. More often than not, unfortunately, look back to 2016 as a prime example when you had all these contracts that are still you know, just slowly starting to come off the books now or being bought out like Louis Erickson and Kyle Poso and Andrew Ladd. Like, it was a bad day. GMs made a lot of bad decisions. And every year when free agency kicks off, it's almost the same thing year after year. But uh, obviously there's a lot of good deals. I think there was time in 2021 as well, not just some bad ones. And the bad ones this year, I don't think are as bad as what we've seen in the past. So, so let's go over the contracts that I've selected here. There's a couple I'm kind of on the fence on, but I'm going to give you my best and worst. Getting started with the best, and these are not in any particular order either. So this is not, doesn't mean this one is the best one, but one that I thought was really sneaky good was the Maple Leafs signing former Coyote Michael Bunting. He gets a two-year deal at 950000 To me, that's a, a really good deal for Toronto. This guy... I think with more of an opportunity, will be able to score at the NHL level. He can be a good, uh, probably third-line player, brings a lot of speed. He can play aggressive. Uh, and I just think this is a real sneaky good signing. Like The Leafs need to be real cautious with their cap space, obviously, because of the amount of money tied up in the big four guys in the forward group. And they need players that they can get good value on who can outperform their contracts and guys that will likely only be there short term because if they outperform them too much, they're going to need raises. They won't be able to give it to them, and they'll have to move on, and the cycle continues. But for Arizona to let Michael Bunting go, um, you know, that was a big loss to them, in my opinion. He was a real good scorer last year, even though it was a, you know, a small spurt, a small sample. He's a little bit of a late bloomer. He has connections to Kyle Dubas and Sheldon Keith from their junior days in the Sioux. So no big surprise that they wanted to sign him. But to me, I think he can bring a lot, give you a lot of good middle six minutes, and really provide a lot of value for that kind of contract. So I really like that one a lot. Another contract I was really fond of was the Avalanche re-signing Gabriel Landeskog. Now I know this one came right down to the absolute last minute, right down to the wire. He gets an eight-year deal at $7 million per season, but to me, $7 million is like that sweet spot for Landeskog. He's still young enough that's going to take him into his you know, mid to late 30s a little bit, but still, he's the heart and soul of this team. If they lost Landeskog, that would have been a big loss. I know they lost Philip Grubauer, but they were able to get Darcy Kemper. And as much as Grubauer is a loss, Landis Cog would have been a way bigger one. If I had to pick between the two, I'm taking Landy every single time. Landis Cog, as I said, he, he gives you a ton of offense, plays in a top six role, blocks shots, drops the gloves, a good leader, good captain, been there since day one. And to me, like, he's worth every penny. I wouldn't have gone much more than $7 million. We heard reports he was looking for upwards of 9 I don't know if that was true or not, but if it was, that would have been a little bit insane. But to me, $7 million to keep him there for likely the rest of his career, possibly, that to me is a great contract all day long. Now, I also really like a couple of the deals we saw from the two-time cup champion Tampa Bay Lightning, bringing in a couple of veteran players. They brought in Corey Perry, and they brought back Zach Bogosian. Now, Bogosian was there for the first cup, wasn't there for the second one because he played with the Leafs, goes back to the, the Lightning, and he takes a three-year deal at under 900 k Like, for a guy who can be a depth defenseman, third-pair guy, but he's steady, like, to me, you can't beat that kind of value. I mean, he wants to win and he just wants to be in a consistent place where he and his family can settle for a few years 
Obviously, he probably left a little bit of money on the table, but obviously playing in Florida too gets him a little bit more money in his pocket because of the difference in state taxes. So there is that a geographical advantage in that regard. Gets to go back to a place where he won a Stanley Cup and he will be able to likely compete for more. So to me, that's an easy deal. It's not a huge impact signing, but these are good value contracts. Same with Corey Perry. Corey Perry's in a warrior who's been battling for a Stanley Cup the past two years, losing in the finals both times to the Lightning. Even though a lot of people said, and I said it too, you can't beat him, join him. But I'm not sure it's entirely about that. Listening to him uh, in his comments afterwards, he was intrigued about the idea to be able to win and compete for a cup. But he was also really really happy with getting a two-year deal, whereas most teams, especially the Habs, were offering one. So that's a big difference for his security, especially if he gets hurt or something like that. But, I mean, he's proven he can still play, and when it's big game time and playoff time, he was a huge part of the Habs' success this year, and that will be a big loss for Montreal. And I think he'll likely be uh, on a good value contract, two years and a million bucks apiece. I mean, to me, for, for what Perry brings you and all that leadership and the playoffs, well worth the money, and just a couple of really good, sneaky good signings there by the Lightning. I really like the signing of the Montreal Canadiens getting defenseman David Savard as well. Now, he's not going to be able to replace Shea Weber. I don't think anybody can. He's a unique player, but he's a guy who can take up a large chunk of the minutes that Weber is not going to be able to be on the ice for. To get a four-year deal at under $4 million bucks for this kind of player who just won a Stanley Cup and can log those kind of minutes and has good experience and is a decent two-way defender... To me, that's an excellent value. I really like this contract for Montreal. Uh, obviously, their top big four, as we called them, through the playoffs with Weber and Sherratt and Edmondson and Petrie were an absolutely huge part of that team's success. Without them, they don't go to the Stanley Cup final, in my opinion. They lose Weber, who's a captain, a leader. And, you know, Savard is, like I said, he's not going to be able to give you everything that Weber did. But out of all the guys that were on the market that they could have went after to try to replace and plug those minutes... This was an excellent option. He was thrilled to take the contract. He said as soon as Montreal came calling, he was looking to sign. Uh, obviously, he's happy to go home to his province of Quebec, represent the Montreal Canadiens, and continue to play some solid hockey. So to me, another great signing that I really liked. Another one that I found confusing and why he didn't get an option to stay where he was, but that's a Pais Suter with Chicago. I mean, Chicago didn't want to sign Suter. He had a good rookie season. I don't get it. I mean, I understand... Uh, you know, they have a lot of good forwards there, but still, like, to me, he was one of the better ones that would have been worth keeping around. So he doesn't get qualified. And then he goes off, and Steve Eiserman swoops in and signs him on a two-year deal of $3.25 million. Like, to me, another great example of Steve Eiserman taking advantage of other GM's mistakes, in my opinion. He also has history of playing with guys on the Red Wings like Bertuzzi and Fabry during their junior days. So, obviously, there's familiarity there. Uh, some friends and line mates that he's had with them in the past. Maybe get a little bit of that old junior magic back going again. Who knows? But either way, like he's a young guy looking to make a mark. Had a good rookie season. And it's another great like smaller scale signing. But it's going to have good value and good, good impact here for the Red Wings in my opinion. Next up, I am going to say that I really do like this Dougie Hamilton signing by the New Jersey Devils. It's a lot of money. But you know what? Based on the market, I think he's worth it. We've seen Zach Wierenski now get paid more money than Dougie Hamilton. But to me, Dougie Hamilton's a little bit more of a unique player. Plays that right side, which is hard to find nowadays. You know, he's six foot six, big, tall defenseman, uh, provides a ton of offense. And to me, this was a great signing by New Jersey. And it's going to give that team a major signal that we're taking it to the next step. Our rebuild is still in, in the works. But this is a big piece to take us forward. They also signed Jonathan Bernier uh, to me, who's, I don't have him on my list of my favorite contracts that were done, but I don't have any issues with it either. He's going to be a great mentor for Mackenzie Blackwood. He's going to solidify that goaltending tandem to make them stronger between the pipes. And then, of course, you get this massive contract for Hamilton, who's going to be there for a long time as their young core guys like Nico Heischer and Jack Hughes and all their young forwards continue to develop and hopefully turn this team into a consistent winner again when they're ready and able to do so. And Hamilton will play a big role in that. So to me, I think they went out and spent some money. They sent a signal that they're willing to take it to the next step. And that will be huge for their organization. Now, another smaller, sneaky good signing here, in my opinion, is Yanni Hockenpah of the Carolina Hurricanes, who leaves Carolina to sign with Dallas. I thought he was a great fit in Carolina. And to me, the Hurricanes have made some puzzling choices this year. And yes, there are some Hurricane contracts 
on my not so favorite list that we're going to get into here in a moment. But this was a player who was really steady for them, was getting a chance to play over guys like Jake Gardner in the playoffs. I thought it was worth keeping him around. He signs in Dallas on a three-year deal at only $1.5 million. Now, may he have left Carolina even if they would have made more of an effort? It is possible because he did state one of the things he was really looking for on top of the longer term, the three years was important to have some stability, but he really wanted to try to be around people from his home country of Finland. Uh, the, the Dallas Stars have a huge Finn contingency there. I mean, obviously, defenseman Mir Heiskanen being probably the most notable out of all the bunch, but you know, you have other prominent Finns in the, in the roster here. I think they have four or five altogether, and that was important to him to be around some of his fellow countrymen. So, you know what? I'm not sure if, if the Finns, I'm not sure if Carolina could have been able to really get him in that regard. But still, this is a small contract. But he's it's one of those guys that you don't notice a lot because he does the little things right. He's a good-sized defenseman, makes smart plays, good breakout, nothing flashy about him. But he's just he's a really smart D that just doesn't seem to really ever give up the big home run 10-bell turnover or really make many mistakes. It's just a steady guy back there can give you that 15 to 18 minutes and to me this is like i said just a sneaky good signing by the stars now as i mentioned there's a couple of contracts i'm putting as like i'm on on the fence i'm not really saying they're horrible so i'm not putting them on my worst contract list but i'm not saying i love them either so i'm not putting them on my best contract list i'm kind of in the middle and i'll let you guys decide as an audience just where these should go first up is zach hyman with the edmonton Oilers. i think i have some things i like about it and I have some things I don't like about it. For example, he gets a seven-year max term here based on him changing teams at $5.5 million. That is a lot of dinero for Zach Hyman. He's a great player. I love Zach Hyman. I love the energy and the hard work and the offense that he can give you. I mean, he had the last two years, if you look at the pro-rated seasons, because we haven't had it full 82 games in the last two seasons now, he was on pace for both those years to be a rate right around 60 points. So you understand why these agents felt like they could drive his price tag to $5.5 million per season. I, I, I kind of get that. But the fact that he's making more money than Ryan Nugent Hopkins, who's first overall pick, been with the Oilers a long time, that could be a little bit problematic here, in my opinion. And it's not only an issue that way, but it could really hinder their cap situation. But he'll be a great line mate for Connor McDavid. Like I've heard some, some people say, Zach Hyman must have been a really awesome person in a previous life to be given this kind of opportunity now where he gets a chance to play in the NHL with first with Austin Matthews and then with Connor McDavid. Like, yes, that is a very excellent opportunity that I'm hoping he's going to take advantage of. He'll work hard in the corners. He'll create the space for McDavid and Dreisaitl and give them that opportunity to be even more effective as well. So I do think he'll be a good fit. I don't, I don't have any problem with the fit, but the, given his age, the injuries he's been through, I do have some concerns on the term, and I do think the money is a little bit rich, but I understand in free agency, you do have to overpay a little bit to get your guy, but like I said, teams are not built in free agency, so sometimes when you have to overpay, maybe you shouldn't, and maybe you should just go in another direction and go about things a little bit differently, but like I said, I like Hyman as a player. I see he'll be a good fit. I don't have any issues with this deal on a short-term basis, but given a seven-year term, I think in a you know two, three, four years down the road before it's half over, it's going to become problematic for Edmonton. It's going to really, uh, you know, maybe not age well. Let's just call it that. I mean, it might be fine. I just hope that he can keep his offense at a high enough level that it justifies itself. But that's where my concerns are that it won't. Now, the other one we're going to put in this category is Blake Coleman. Now, we knew Blake Coleman and guys like Barkley Goudreau were going to get overpaid and get a substantial raise given their impact on the Lightning in the last two Stanley Cups. And you know what? They have had a major impact. I don't have any issue with that. I knew this was coming, but still, I have concerns over this contract too. However, I think if this one has more potential for me to end up on the good side than Hyman longer term, given with Coleman's that in his career, and the fact that I think even though the money at $4.9 million for six years, he's been a third-line player the last... Uh, almost two seasons. But before that, when he was in New Jersey, he played a regular top six role. So it really depends on how the Calgary Flames plan to utilize Coleman. If they want to try to play him to be more of a shutdown defensive winger who can also pitch him with the offense and play like a top six role, like to me, depending on how they use him, it could work. But if, if Coleman is stuck playing 
14, 15 minutes a night on your third line making almost $5 million bucks. I don't care how good he is defensively. That's too much money. At the end of the day, you need guys who can play defense. You need guys who can play in the PK. You need guys like Coleman. He's an important piece. But the money has to go to the offensive guys. doesn't matter how good you are defensively. If you can't score, you can't win. It's just that simple. Uh, you know. And so I have worries over that issue. But if they use him right and they play him with the right line mates in a top six role and he can get back to scoring 20 goals a season like he was in New Jersey and also give you the strong special teams and everything else that he provides, this could age well and could be a very good fit and turn out to be a really good contract longer term. So we'll see. But it's up to Calgary to do him right and get him in the right role here. Now, jumping into the contracts that I'm not fond of, and I'm calling the worst contracts of this free agent period. First up, we've got Martin Jones in Philadelphia. I I understand they needed a goaltender. I would have rather seen them keep Ryan Elliott, to be honest. Not that I'm opposed to them making a change here, because I can understand that things have not gone well. So shaking things up was probably not a terrible idea. But of all the goalies on the market, you go for Martin Jones. And you know what? Martin Jones has been very consistent the past three years. And the one thing he's been consistent with is being terrible. His stats are absolutely atrocious. Sub-900 save percentage. Uh, can't stop a beach ball at times. And the Sharks are in their predicament of being on such a losing team. Largely because they can't get a big save when they really need it. Because this is a guy, to me, that is not the answer to trying to give more of a you know, partnership with Carter Hart and to take the pressure off him and to help him bounce back. What is Martin Jones going to do here? I just don't see this going well at all for, for, for Philly and Jones. We need Carter Hart to bounce back from the Flyers' perspective here. That's a huge thing for them to be able to take things forward. If They, they made a lot of moves here. They've really tried to shake things up. On the blue line, they have a whole new decor, which is going to help. You know, They've made some moves in the forward group too. But if they can't get a save when it matters most, it's going to go to the wayside and it's going to be wasted. And I just don't see Martin Jones being that kind of guy. In today's NHL, when you need guys to play more and have more of a platoon, he's not the guy that's going to answer your problems here. So to me, I don't like this contract at all for Philly. Next up, we have Alex Wenberg and his Seattle Kraken, where he signed a three-year deal of $4.5 million. To me, this was a massive overpayment. We've seen Wenberg go through some good times and bad times at Columbus, end up getting bought, bought out, goes on to Florida. Of course, former GM Bill Zito knew him from Columbus, gave him a one-year short-term cheap contract to bounce back, and he did bounce back. He had a much better season. He was playing with stronger players. That also helps, too. And now he gets this massive raise going to Seattle, who were thin at the center position based on expansion. They signed him as a free agent, so I, I have no problem with the signing, but it's way too much money in my opinion. I can see them as early as year one regretting the amount of money that they're paying Wenberg. Uh, you know, that to me, it just was not justified by one shortened bounce back season after what he's been through for the last declining seasons towards his end of his time in Columbus. And even though, like I said, they're short on centers in, in Seattle right now, I don't know what else they're going to do before the season starts. But if he ends up playing a top six role for them, I think they're going to be in trouble. Now, next up, I have a big issue with the Carolina Hurricanes and the whole goaltending situation. Now, of course, they signed Freddie Anderson and Antti Ranta. I don't really have much of an issue with the Ranta contract, but the fact that they had to trade Nedeljkovic is the whole thing that they which really they didn't need to do. They only he only needed to pay him three to three point five million. A young up and coming goaltender finally gets his NHL opportunity after all that time and development and 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 everything they put into him. He gets to the NHL. He's a third finalist and rookie of the year. Phenomenal year. Played strong in the playoffs. And then they trade him because they didn't want to give him his money. Like and, and he wasn't looking for an outrageous amount. Like I have real concerns over this franchise. And then they don't bring back Peter Morazic. They were lowballing him too. And I think to be honest, they had this plan all along that they wanted more experienced goaltenders. I've heard the comments from Don Waddell before the signings were even official that they want an experience. They're a team that is trying to win now. They don't need a young goaltender. They want an experienced goaltender who can take them over the top. But what have these guys won? Nothing. Freddie Anderson has not gotten out of the first round with Toronto. Rant has barely had any playoff time with the Coyotes. He's hurt all the time. Like To me, this was a disaster for the Hurricanes. I do not like the contracts at all. Freddie Anderson, after a disastrous season last year, only gets a short 
uh, you know, a decrease in pay from $5 million to four point five for two years. So I'm not a fan of that. I'm not completely opposed to them bringing in one of these two guys. But if I'm going to bring in one, then obviously I'm going to say the Ranta contract is better, but you should have kept Nadelkovich. And if you couldn't come to terms with Mrazek, Ranta's not a bad option to bring in to work with Nadelkovich. If you could have had Ranta at 2, Nadelkovich at 3.5, you could have saved some money and had better goaltending. Like I said, I'm not a completely against Freddie Anderson. I think he could bounce back and still be a good goalie in this league. I just don't see why Carolina had to do this and, and see this as an upgrade. They're going to have to be relying on both Anderson and Ranta to bounce back, which is not something that's really, you know, all that reliable. It's a risky move when you had two in-house goalies that were more than capable, but you didn't want to pay them. So to me, I don't like this move at all. Next up, there's the Phil Deneau contract in LA. He's got a six-year deal of $5.5 million. And again, I think this is too much money. I'm not too much of a problem with the term. But for a guy who just does not provide you the offense. Now, I know there's going to be some, if you go through a lot of the five-on-five five stats and the points per 60, he actually didn't have as bad a year last year as it looked. But to me, he struggled hardcore. And I think a lot of his struggles came from the contract negotiations. Montreal offered him a very similar contract. He held out, did not sign, leaves Montreal, and basically only got 500k more per year, which... You know what? Overall, it's a, it's a fair bit of money. It's, you know, that's $3 million in six years. So it's nothing to sneeze at for sure. However, like he went from in Montreal saying that he was concerned about a spot in the lineup because of the young emergent centers like Suzuki and Kakaniemi providing that competition and where he dropped down, it was more of a number three defensive specialist. Well, that's what you are, Phil Dino. You are a defensive specialist and you're going to LA where you're going to play behind... Anze Kopitar, and you've got young guys that play center like Quinton Byfield and Alex Turcott coming right up behind you as well. So it's not like you don't have any less competition. In fact, you probably have more in L.A. than Montreal. So you know what? I don't understand the fit uh, from his perspective. Now, from the team's perspective, I do like the fit. and It's not that I don't like the player there. I think having a great defensive center like to know behind Kopitar will likely allow Kopitar to be even more offensive and get better matchups so he doesn't have to be the uh, the defensive matchup on the other side all the time. You can pick and choose your line matches better and you can get more offense out of Kopitar. Dano is going to have to be the guy getting the more tougher defensive assignments because he doesn't produce the offense that Kopi can. So to me, that makes a lot of a lot of sense in that regard. But I think this is a lot of money from LA for a defensive specialist here. I'm just not confident that we're going to see the offensive results to go with it over that six year period to justify what they paid him here. We we'll got two more to go, and the last one, second last one here is Ryan Suter in Dallas. Four years, four million bucks per year. That's a lot of money and a lot of term on a guy that just got bought out in Minnesota. Uh, he made it clear that he wanted to win a Stanley Cup and he end up in Dallas. To me, Dallas is not a cup contender at this point. In my opinion, at least they're not. I know they went to the finals two years ago, but I don't see them having an easy time getting back. So I don't really think he's really in it. I think he's more in it for the money. That's just my opinion. Now, there's also some issues with Ryan Suter that people are, there's rumors floating around that he was not great in the locker room and they really want to change their culture. So he doesn't give you some question marks that regard too. But regardless of all that, for a guy who's going to be 40 years old at the end of this contract, you give him the four years, like the $4 million was, uh, it's not terrible for one or two years, but for four years, that's way too much. I mean, I was would have liked to rather have seen him go to a team like the Islanders or the Boston Bruins. I thought that would have been a better fit for him. A uh, better shot at a cup too. But they were not offering four years. Dallas was. So to me, I would have not signed a guy just getting bought out at age 36 to a four-year deal. I just don't see that one aging well at all. Now lastly, we're going to look at the Edmonton Oilers and the Cody Cece deal. Cece gets a four-year contract, which amazed me, at $3.25 million. I don't have too much of an issue with the dollar amount, but four years for Cody Cece. Like, you had an opportunity, Ken Holland, to keep Adam Larson, and you couldn't get that done. He goes to Seattle. I mean, that would have been the much easier, better option to me, is that if you could have done that, but it sounded like Larson wanted out and wanted a fresh start. For whatever reason, you couldn't keep him. So that's unfortunate. But, you know, of, of all the guys that you could have went after in free agency, I don't know, you brought back Tyson Berry too, which is fine. I have no problem with the offense that Tyson Berry can bring. But then you go in and bring in Cody Cece too. Like, I just 
To me, it's a lot of term. The guy is way overrated. He had a better year last year in Pittsburgh than I expected him to have. So I think if given him the right role and the right partner in the right minutes, it can be okay. But still, it's a lot of term. And I really think the Oilers could have overpaid here. And I really think that they could have went in a different direction and found a cheaper defenseman that could have been just as effective. But really, at the end of the day, keeping Adam Larson was by far the better choice that they should have hopefully found a way to get done. And that's just that. So those are all my worst and best contracts from free agency so far. Of course, as always, we'll know what you think as well. So let me know your comments down in the, in the comment section here. Which contracts do you feel were the best? Which ones are the worst? Which ones are driving you crazy? Which ones do you see not aging well and being really problematic down the road? Let me know that and we'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest news and rumors and free agency and everything else with the offseason at Top Shelf Hockey. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time.